Welcome to Line Check, a series of public forum events with Minnesota artists and industry professionals discussing various topics affecting the local art scene presented by The Current. My name is Diane, host of The Local Show. I will be sitting down with Minnesota musicians, artists, and friends at a look behind the scenes at what our artists need to do to build up and keep their careers on track. This spring, we'll be discussing an array of topics, including NFTs and cryptocurrency, the art making process, and applying for grants. And you can register for the live events or catch them on the Currents YouTube channel. And today, we are talking about navigating putting on shows during a pandemic. To start off with, I'm going to air an interview I conducted with the Gully Boys, an active Minneapolis rock band who were on tour when we chatted. And then we will get into a video with our musical guest, Nat Harvey of Duluth, Minnesota. But first, let's see our interview with the Gully Boys. The pandemic has had a huge effect on logistics, business, and artistry that goes into putting on concerts. And today I'm sitting with a couple of members of the Gully Boys to talk about their experience of holding a band together during a pandemic. And we're so excited to have y'all here because for one, I know how busy y'all have been uh, recently on, on tour right now. So, and secondly, um, the Gully Boys have always set a standard of doing good in the community between raising funds and just showing overall support for folks who need it in our neighborhoods. So I just want to take the time to acknowledge that and say thank you for all that you do. Thank you so much for having us this yeah, morning. Thank you. The Gully Boys inspired The Current to have this particular conversation after y'all put out a specific tweet and it uh, said, Minnesota artists, would you be interested in a town hall with other Minnesota artists to discuss navigating playing shows during a pandemic in the new year? This all feels very isolating and doing this alone with no direction and no guidance and we would love to chat with others in the community. Um, Take me back to this past December when y'all were putting on this very successful residency at the 7th Street entry, and then all of a sudden COVID cases numbers started rising and you had to make the decision to cancel your event during a time when not only did it cost the part of your livelihoods of, as performing artists, but also affected your ability to put a meal on the table. Take me back to that uh, time. That was really tricky because it was right right before the really bad surge around Christmas and no one else was canceling any shows. And we had a couple people kind of ask about it online mm -hmm. and be like, hey, this is about to happen. Everybody's seeing their families for the holidays. Um, and we just kind of decided that as much, we'd put on four, three of the four shows mm -hmm. and they all went really well. So we were really looking forward to that last one, but we kind of just counted ourselves lucky as having done that much and decided to cut the last one and i think retrospectively we're really glad we did yeah i got COVID. Yeah. Like, after that, so I was yeah. glad that we did not we did not put it on but it was a really hard decision to make you know mm -hmm. it was like people were traveling to come play that show and right. so it was a matter of like do they need to cancel their flights and um it kind of came down to the wire and we just had to go with our gut and decided that it was the right thing to do to not to not put it on yeah. Yeah. And I, I feel like not a lot of us expected uh, us to go through another heavy, like, <laughs> like it came out of nowhere all of a sudden. And then do you feel like it was a surprise as well? Like that all of a sudden you would have to be, cause I mean, people were masking, we we're still taking precautions and stuff, but did you feel like it came out of surprise that you were like, oh, we have to cancel? I don't think so personally, just because I feel like everyone kind of over the summer started getting this feeling that the pandemic was over. Um, mm -hmm. But we never, I don't know, from our perspective, I don't know that we ever really thought that. And we were hearing about different variants and things and coming back in waves and kind of seeing the way that mm -hmm. work in these waves as the virus mutates. So mm -hmm. um, we were optimistic. Obviously, we went ahead and put on the residency to begin with, but I, I think that we were wary. And yeah. I mean, even to, even to this day, we're, we're seeing another variant. So I don't know. We're just kind of taking it in stride and not taking anything for granted. Right. I feel like the winter time too, like, <laughs> kind of warned that uh, the virus would get worse in the winter and maybe you chill out during the summer and then the cold months come and it gets worse again. But and you yeah. Knew Everybody being vaccinated, the holidays 
last year were going to be different than 2020. You know, I feel like 2020, I don't think I went home for Christmas or anything, but everyone was vaccinated and we knew everybody was going to be doing that again. So mm -hmm. I think we were tentatively, we were hopeful and optimistic about it, but I think we... Um, it's just it, always at the back of your mind. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Right. And it's like our decision too. It's like when, when right. <laughs> there's so little like um regulation so little like uh like it, it comes down to like well whatever you guys want to do yeah. you're the band and it's like just a, a lot of pressure to make that decision it's like and then you and then like and then it's like oh well well people can come or not if they want to right. but it's like okay well if you still have the show they're gonna want to come it's like yeah you have to decide for other people which is like which is kind of why we put out that tweet because we were like yeah this it feels so lonely like i don't know right. we we'd feel like we're supposed to be like the the people deciding what's right to do during a pandemic and that feels very right. wrong we're just trying to play some music you guys <laughs> <laughs> yeah to self-reference i put on a show um in J january and this was like maybe weeks after and i was so stressed i was just like i shouldn't and then i ended up doing it and i felt i was kind of like maybe i shouldn't have and but yeah leading up to it i was just like should i do it should i not and then i would have to reschedule like all of these factors tell me about some of the things um that you were considering as you were saying oh should we do it or should we not what are what were some of the things that came into your decision making we um we were trying to enforce masks. I can't recall if First Ave was still requiring them, but I know that we were still kind of like being like, please wear a mask. Um, it was kind of right when we were finding out that KN95s were significantly more effective than other masks. So we we're trying to like, is there a way that we can have people be wearing those? And is that something we would need to provide? Um, and also, yeah, just again, the thing of like, people do have a choice and whether they come to the show or not, but, um, also, by putting on shows, we're kind of creating this idea that it's normal for the show to go on when there is a surge of COVID and right. like, what's our responsibility in that context? Um, and I think that's ultimately what it came down to is like, um, if everybody just says, oh, everybody else is still doing shows, so we're going to keep doing shows, um, then I don't know, we're kind of screwed. Yeah, uh, an echo chamber. Yeah. Of <laughs> which we were already worried about in putting on the first three. So. And I have to imagine like y'all have been in getting increasingly more and more fans and just uh, doing so well and, and gaining more and more popularity and putting out really great music. And, and so I feel like you're probably held to this greater standard of like, okay, now we really have to be leaders and, and all that. So and tell tell me how tour has been going um and how states are handling the pandemic with within shows i'm sure like state to state it's different city to city it's different it's like we've been saying like everyone who comes to our shows we kind of get a similar crowd at every place but the culture uh, the pandemic culture is so different like when we were in new york anywhere you go in immediately restaurant bar wherever they ask you for a vax card so everyone's vaccinated right. no one's wearing a mask um, but then somewhere like Chicago, it was like everyone was wearing a mask. And then some places, it's neither. So right. it's been tricky to navigate as people going state to state and trying not to get COVID. Yeah. Even right. I was that, um, when we were, we were in South by, um, and they like, you kept getting like um, notifications from the app, like, please remember to wear your masks, everybody. Da, 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 da. You'd go into a bar, no one's wearing a mask. No it's like, uh, and it's hard too because half of those spaces are like half outdoor, half indoor. So people are like, well, I'm just gonna, I mean, I'm, it takes me like 30 seconds to walk to the outside, like yeah. the outdoor venue in the back. So, I, but that was surprising to see like, so few people wearing masks out South by, and then, you know, turns out a lot of people got COVID. <laughs> like, uh, yeah. Yeah, it, it kind of feels like COVID's over in a way, because, you know, a lot of places are laxing and, and um, their um, cases are starting to slow down overall. Um, how else are y'all adapting to this change as a band as COVID numbers are starting to 
to go down. Um, I think it's tricky. I think we're still kind of navigating it and trying to figure it out. Um, you have a whole spectrum of what people think should be happening right now. So it's mm-hmm. like, who do you go to for the most reliable information? And um, it's just kind of like reading all the sources and deciding for yourself, which feels terrible because <laughs> um, yeah. nobody's on the same page. <laughs> so um, there are going to be people right. who are mad. We're still, I mean, we're still asking people, a lot of venues have dropped the mask mandate or have dropped the vaccination mandate. And we're still asking people to wear that because if we get COVID, we can't be doing the thing that we're doing. Right. Um, so exactly. it's, it's really tricky. It's really tricky. I don't think we have a solid answer. Yeah. I feel like masks also help, like masks help uh, just the spread of germs in general too. Like, <laughs> like yeah. even if we if we have COVID or if we have the flu, like we still can't play a show if we have the flu, right. you know. So it's um. We're happy. Saying. Our leader is literally screaming into the crowd. Yeah. So it's like <laughs> if we're sick, <laughs> we're spreading germs, and you're not wearing a mask. I don't know. That's such a so questionable. So we were playing these festivals, and everybody's sharing a mic. You have like seven different bands like just making out with a microphone <laughs> over a course of an hour like <laughs> it's just it's germ city dude yeah. <laughs> if the pandemic starts to ramp up again and and we have to quarantine how do you envision spending your time or do you have a game plan for that i feel like we would just write yeah i think we would write too the first half was so chaotic and stressful but i feel like we're kind of used to the rise and fall of like, okay, I'm not going out for a couple of months and I'm being really careful. So I don't envision that happening. I think uh, I would be very surprised if that happened again, just given how the response has been, even as numbers have gone up and down. Mm-hmm. Um, but I think, yeah, we're trying to write in the next couple of months anyway. So I think that would be an opportunity for that if it were to happen. Yeah. It's tricky because we all have jobs too. So, um, mm. kind of trying to juggle band and job and the stress of a global pandemic is uh, it's tricky. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, if you know, thinking back even to before some of your residencies, if you could do anything differently, are there any things that come to mind? Not really. <laughs> <laughs> We're really trying our best out here. Yeah. It's been such uncharted territory that I don't know. I don't know. How. Maybe in like 15 years, we'll look back right. and have a better understanding of what was going on. But as of right now, if we're rolling with the punches, you know. Nadi, our drummer, is amazing with TikTok and social media. So um, they've kind of really propelled us with that over the pandemic, which was kind of like how we stayed afloat, just like with engagement and talking to folks online um, while everything was shut down. Mm -hmm. But yeah, juggling everything we were juggling, I don't know. I don't don't know what we would have done differently. Mm -hmm. So it just seems like it's a lot of like unknowns and just rolling with the punches. Keeps you on your toes, I suppose. That's maybe one thing that is. We're not taking anything for granted. We just had to cancel our Treat Fort show because of this. Our window exploded on the highway, and we're like, okay, that one's out. Like, right. we're so used to just being like, okay, this thing I thought it was going to happen is not. Um... Right. It's kind of the nature of just being a musician anyway, <laughs> yeah. rolling with the punches. Yeah. But definitely, we're more used to it Absolutely. now. Absolutely. The first yep. shows that got canceled in 2020, yeah. that, I mean, to play rock the garden and we were so crushed and i think by now we're just kind of like okay that one's out yeah (laughs) yeah yeah Yeah, that was i mean uh, this january too like oh my god i uh my friend megan mahoney they're a bassist around town they had Mm -hmm. like gigs on gigs on gigs every single one canceled (laughs) and they're just like i'm at the point now where i'm like I'm assuming that this gig, if I book a gig, it there's a like huge chance that'll get canceled. Yeah. Like you just have to yeah. accept. I mean, <laughs> we, we were saying that about this tour right up until we left. We're yeah, like, um, this will probably happen, but if it doesn't, it doesn't. Right. Like, yeah. So like, yeah, you have to kind of mentally prepare yourself. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. Living in I uncertainty constantly. Yeah. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> 
Well, and I guess I think a good question to ask what is what advice would you give to folks who want to support local musicians during a pandemic? Because so many of us rely on live music for our, you know, our mental health and and you know from the artist to the audience. Like I'm definitely someone who's just like going to shows, listening to music is so important to me. So what advice would you give to folks who want to support? Still wear a mask, even if you feel stupid and other people aren't, you're keeping artists safe Mm -hmm. who are probably traveling from place to place and making themselves very vulnerable. Our immune systems are down because we're traveling and our eating schedule and our sleeping schedule is off. So I don't know, out of the safety and care of the artists that are performing for you. Make sure you're still being safe because we are still in a pandemic. It's not over. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Buy merch if the band has merch. Buy that up. That so is. (laughs) We're glorified t-shirt salesmen, so (laughs) that's always a good good way to support. Um, A lot of bands just like have like tip jars to like just throw some bucks on Venmo or whatever. If you got a stable work from home job and you got a little money to spare, the people who are super affected by this could could use some. Yes. Thank you so much, the Gully Boys. Have a great rest of your tour. We look forward to seeing you back in Minneapolis. from Nat Harvey, who is of Duluth, Minnesota. 
they just released a new album called Married in Song. You can check them out on all the platforms. You are tuned into Line Check, and I am, and it's a live recording of the uh, of the series, and we have two special guests. Um, concerts have to be one of the most difficult industries to manage during a pandemic. And the goal is to bring in large amounts of people into one room. And today I am with two experts to talk about their expertise on this subject. First Avenue's general manager, Nate Kranz, and the president of the Minnesota chapter of the National Independent Venue Alliance, Meneva, Shane, Mel Shane Melgard. And uh, we also have a live audience with us today. So please bring your questions towards the end of this session. Nate, uh, let's start with you. Take me back to when First Avenue really started to realize that this pandemic was going to have a raging effect on the the concert industry. Um, what was that experience like having to cancel show after show and not having a clear outline on what the future was going to look like? I mean, obviously, it was pretty weird. I know that uh, for me personally, it started to become pretty realistic on March 10th. We had a show with Wilco in Duluth, and just the whole vibe was getting to be pretty heavy. And we were starting to really see COVID hesitancy in audiences. Um, that particular night, we had, I don't know, maybe about half of the people that actually had tickets ended up showing up to the concert. Uh, there was a backstage meeting. And Wilco decided to finish their tour, to cancel the rest of their tour after that particular night, um, which said to me, all right, things are getting pretty real. I know that on my drive back, I was strategizing with other people in our office and other booking agents. And we started thinking, this is going to be really bad. We might need to pause or cancel shows for a couple of weeks. And that's what we started doing, moving concerts from, say, you know, March of 2020 into let's be extra safe. Let's move them into May of 2020. But after that point, we felt we'd be pretty good. If you remember, we were a couple of weeks to flatten the curve and then things should be pretty good, right? Uh, I don't remember the exact timeline, but it was pretty clear in a short amount of time that it wasn't going to be just a couple of weeks. And so it kind of came in, uh, is the word cascading, um, the bad news, in that it was a, a larger wave followed by an even larger wave. And the next thing you know, we realized that everything on our calendar was in doubt. Um, and, you know, it's, it's, I hate to say it, but in this business, you kind of, you get used to, not this kind of a surprise, but you kind of get used to rolling with the punches and solving problems um, as they arise. And we just kind of put our heads down and started saying, okay, let's start rebooking all of these shows. And at first it was mainly a lot of postponements. And then with each kind of wave where it started looking that this was going to last longer and longer, it would be, all right, half of the shows are going to postpone again. Half of them are going away for the time being. And it was all just kind of a blur for a minute until the next thing you know, our entire calendar was gone and we were waiting it out. Yeah, no kidding. I, 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 <laughs> I want to <laughs> turn to you, Shana. And first, I want to bring up the statistics thing that I, I saw on, on Maniva's website. The U.S. Bureau of Economic Analysis reports that arts, arts and cultural production accounts for over $12 billion and 3.5% of Minnesota's economy uh, contributing, contributes to uh, uh, nearly 100,000 jobs. This ranks third among all industries in the state, behind only retail and construction. For every $1 spent on a ticket at small venues, a total of $12 in economy economic activity is generated. So the, Min the Minnesota Independent Venue Alliance started as a result of the pandemic to help arts and arts organizations stay afloat. Shana, can you tell us a, b a bit about the gravity of the economic impact the pandemic had on the music business and some of the initiatives that 
many have uh, put in place to help the community. Yeah, absolutely. And I want to go back just to something Nate said, because I remember um, I'm also the talent buyer for Sue McLean and Associates. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was March 13th. We had an email exchange. We had a show um, at the Fitzgerald, which is operated by um, and owned by First Ave. And so the question was, what are we doing about our um, our show on St. Patrick's Day a week later? Mm -hmm. And um, Nate, do you remember this? <laughs> yeah, the um, show just we, finally played. <laughs> it did, two years later. So <laughs> we thought in March of 2020, we said, maybe we'll just celebrate St. Patrick's Day in May. We'll just do May 17th and said, and that show just played off two years later after being postponed a couple of times. Um, so that is um, just one example of how far out some of these things have been pushed uh, due to the pandemic. But um, to answer your actual question about our economic um, impact, I mean, as you as you know, when you go to a show, you don't just go to a show. You go to dinner, you go get drinks. Um, you know, some people are coming in from out of town. They're staying at hotels, they're taking lifts and Ubers and, um, you know, shopping and things like that. So our business is of bringing um, lots and lots of people into one space, um, require lots of people to work those events, and they also generate a lot of economic activity for other small businesses. So when we were hit with closures, um, the Minnesota Stay Home, Stay Safe plan, um, we decided to kind of support that in any way we could because we thought that was the fastest way to get reopened was if we just would um, amplify the message of um, staying home, masking up, keeping everybody um, safe, maybe this will be, you know, two months. You know, maybe this will be a shorter period of time. But in the background of this, um, Dana Frank from First Ave um, and a bunch of other promoters and uh, venues from across the country were all having conversations. And we were talking about how, how are we gonna weather this storm if this is longer than a couple weeks? And so that is how the National Independent Venue Association came to be. That's how then our Minnesota chapter came to be. Um, and it's really been, um, you know, just us getting together almost out of fear for our collective existence. You know, how are we gonna be here on the other side of this if this shutdown is longer than a couple months and we don't have reserves and we don't have income coming in and we have to keep canceling events. So um, I think for me, it's been sort of, um, you know, all of us, as as the Gully Boys mentioned too, we like live in this uncertainty, but um, live events people are some of the most adaptable people you'll ever meet. I mean, we have, you know, things come up every night that we just have to roll with the punches and figure it out. And so um, that is what we did. We tried to figure it out. <laughs> yeah, there's no, there was no book to read or, you know, guidelines that either of y'all had to really know how to navigate handling shows during a pandemic because nothing's like this has ever happened before. So I applaud both of y'all for like powering through and um, making making our music scene, s s scene still alive and well. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah, let's dig into even more of it. Like what, other, what, what are some other ch venue challenges that artists, um, audiences are, are facing that, that people don't quite realize because not everybody is behind the scenes in the music industry. Um, yeah, Nate, we'll start with you. What are some challenges, uh, other challenges that you're facing? Well, I mean, obviously, like, we have a large staff, so we have a few hundred people um, working for us that we're very concerned about. And so during the pandemic, one of the things was, you know, obviously, like, there's a small group of us who were working on moving shows and doing things like that. But there was a large number of people who were essentially just immediately laid off when this started. And so one of our first concerns beyond, like, what is the future of live music? What is the future of live events? What are we going to do with these venues we own in the meantime? But it was also just, um, you know, out of concern for our staff. And so we had to do things like come up with how can we stay in contact and, and, and provide like an information line and, and, and continue to stay in communication with our staff when really um, they're no longer our employees at that point in time. But, you know, like we definitely wanted them back at the time when 
we, we were able to reopen. And so there was communication amongst, you know, inside of our staff. Obviously, there's the ongoing communication with booking agents and managers. You can imagine just like, uh, it, you know, anybody else having conversations. There was a lot of us like all trying to do our best to be an epidemiologist when really what we're best <laughs> at doing is, you know, putting tickets on sale and things like that. And just a lot of conversations of what ifs, what that, what is the way back? Um, and, and, you know, at first, the, the, the vaccine, when that kind of came on the scene, like it turns tail end of 2020, I got to say for me personally, like that gave me a lot of optimism. I was like, I never expected a vaccine to come that fast. And at the time we thought this is the magic bullet. We're all going to, you know, get vaccinated in spring and uh, in summer it's going to be back to normal, right? We're not going to think about masks. We're not going to think about, uh, you know, any of this stuff. And so that was sort of where our minds were at in spring of 2021, which was let's get our staff back. Let's like fire. We're, we're done postponing shows. Let's really start pushing this stuff. And, and, and we're just really excited that, uh, wow, we were able to survive this pandemic for a year plus. Obviously, um, when Delta came in in the fall of 2021, that dashed a lot of our hopes. We thought that, you know, we all thought December or fall of 2021 would be like, you know, I heard the roaring 20s are back was was sort of the sentiment mm -hmm. that you heard, you know, locally and, and just on a national level. Like, like oh, everybody's been so cooped up. They're going to be ready. They're going to get out there. They're going to buy tickets. They're going to fill these venues. And for a very, very brief amount of time, and I mean brief, uh, July and August, that kind of seemed true. Like anything we put on sale was selling tickets and people were coming out. But um, that next wave, it, it really knocked out most of our calendar. Obviously, you mentioned with the Gully Boys previously, we had them playing in December and they, they kind of soldiered on doing their, doing their residency while shows all around them were falling off the calendar um, for, for good reason. It just, it, it, things were getting, you know, pretty sketchy. Uh, January this year was not great, but once again, I'm, I'm personally, and I think I, as a company, we're feeling optimistic again now about going forward. We've been able to manage cases. I can't say we've had none within our company, but knock on wood, we have not had any big outbreaks. But um, like Shana said, we've also been really trying to follow the CDC guidance and, and really try and follow the best scientists out there and and do what needs to happen to keep, you know, to, to stay in business and keep doing concerts. And every day now we're seeing, obviously, there's still a lot of hesitancy out there with audiences, um, some hesitancy with bands to get out there, of course, and everybody has a different comfortability level. So right now, one of our big challenges is trying to manage that, like trying to manage on a night by night basis, what can we do? Cause it's not going to be the same every night with every artist or every audience, what, what the right protocols to have in place are or, or whatever. So we're just trying to work with each individual artist to present the shows in the way that they feel most comfortable. So we can welcome guests back and, and, and hopefully get past this into whatever the new normal is. Shayna, um, what would you add to that uh, and, and some of the challenges that people may not realize or yeah. in the pandemic? I mean, I, I echo everything that, that Nate's been saying. And we just, you know, being kind of a collective of independent venues and promoters, the whole point of being independent is that you can make these decisions um, within your company and you don't have, you know, you know, there's not one blanket policy that fits every type of venue in all parts of the state or all parts of the country. And so I think that's really good, but we do kind of, um, we do kind of rely on some of the, the leaders in our industry to kind of set the tone. And so when someone like First Ave was, you know, one of the first to enact a vaccine or test policy to enter shows, that kind of gave permission to some of the smaller venues around town to say, okay, if, if you know, if a company that big is going to be able to, to implement this and people are still going to go to shows, then I can do it too. And so they did it, you know, the Hennepin Theater Trust, um, the downtown theaters, we all kind of made these um, policies about the same time. And, and I think that went really well for a while, but then, you know, 
as things are getting a little bit better, as we're you know monitoring cases, we are getting you know some artists now that are saying, can we lift the mandate on my show? And like Nate said, it is sort of case by case. And if you're in northern Minnesota, that may be no problem at all for um, for your attendees. But you know, here, if we put a show on sale with a policy that says you need to wear a mask or you need to have um, some sort of proof of vaccine or have a negative test to enter, if you change that policy in the, before the show happens, you open yourself up for refunds because there's those people who felt comfortable buying a ticket with a policy and there's those people then who would buy a ticket now that there's not. And you're not going to please everybody. And so the fact is, you know, we, we've been opening ourselves up for refunds for a couple years now for various things, you know, related to COVID. And the other, other challenge with that is things like, you know, um, if it's a co-headline show and one of the headliners um, has to cancel due to COVID or something, you do have to offer refunds for something like that. So there's just been challenges um, across the board related to this that um, people maybe wouldn't think of you know, your bus driver tests positive for COVID the day of the show. The show's canceled, you know? So it's not even necessarily like a case within the band or the artist, but we're still finding, you know, things are postponing, but I think people do feel better about, you know, the summer. Um, like Nate mentioned, you know, January was probably one of the worst months, maybe in the history of a company for um, financial, you know, situations because of, uh, Omicron and now everything has sort of been postponed to the spring and so you know while we we're still in recovery mode you know we're not back to normal we're not back to 100% we still have shows that are sold out where only you know 70% of people are showing up um, and that may be due to you know a lot of factors people are used to staying at home more you know maybe they're just you know I don't care I lost you know $20 on a ticket but it's also competition because now all these events are getting rescheduled on top of each other. And so people aren't coming um, out 100% to shows that are sold out, which means we're um, not making as much money on concessions and things like that. So as a business, as a small business, um, we're still kind of fighting for recovery despite all the efforts that Maniva and Neva did on a national level to get these shuttered venue operator grants into the hands of these small business owners. We thought we'd be in a pandemic for maybe a year at that point, and now it's two years, and um, we're still kind of operating at a loss, most of these small businesses, just to kind of get back to where we were in 2020, or 2019 was probably a, a banner year for a lot of um, concert venues and uh, promoters. So it is, it is still a struggle, and um, we're still getting there, but I think, you know, like Nate said, knock on wood, we're all hopeful that we're kind of... Uh, getting there <laughs> <laughs> yeah um let's get more into vaccination and mask wearing policies first avenue like shana mentioned was one of the first in the country to implement these standards and it was controversial people were like celebrating and other people were like what are you doing <laughs> and we've all been to bars and we've all been to restaurants we know the drill you know and some of i mean and some of us don't like to wear masks. It's it's a thing. I don't even like to wear masks. And sometimes when I see other people not wearing, I'm like, oh, cool. I, I'm cool not to not wear them. But it never hurts to be reminded um, why we continue to wear masks, why we have to um, have mask wearing policies. And I'd like to hear uh, both of you all speak on this. And either one can jump in, either of you. Well, I can say that at First Avenue, like we did um, make the call on the vaccine, and this goes for all of our venues. So First Avenue, Palace, whatever, our family of venues, I should say. Mm -hmm. And we made the policy, um, I don't wanna say it was an easy decision, but it we had to kind of look at the reality of what was going on. I believe this was in last July, something like that. And once we started getting open and getting our staff back and having shows, we wanted to stay open. We didn't want to have to get back into another lockdown. And we also just reflected, you know, personally amongst the leadership, like what would make us feel most comfortable. And so we elected to go with this um, policy of vaccine or test to be able to attend shows. We did not have a mask mandate. And that pretty quickly almost became the norm, at least in, you know, 
most of the shows that we deal with, I should say. I don't, I don't know if that ever became the norm in certain genres or all areas of the country, but certainly here it did. And, and that, like, like I said, that wasn't that difficult of a thing. At that point, we did not have a mask mandate. And since then, what we've tried to do is follow the lead of what each individual artist wants and also if there's any city mandate and do our best to enforce it. So when Minneapolis and St. Paul elected to have a mask mandate put in place, um, can't remember exactly when that was, we immediately uh, shifted to enforce that mask mandate per the city guidelines. And we've done so for individual artists at their request. But overall, as a company, we have not had a mask mandate um, at our venues outside of, like I said, the request of the city or the individual artists. But I also think it's important to say that there is, you know, oftentimes a different set of rules for what's going on backstage and in conjunction for people who have close relation, you know, if you're going to work in close proximity with the artist because that was another decision that each artist had to make when they were on the road or coming through was what did they feel comfortable with and so what we've seen is there was a lot of a lot of shows where if you were going to be working you're going to have to take a test and have a negative test regardless of your vaccine status and you know um strict adherence to mask wearing amongst the production crew and catering and artists crew and really even the artists until they walked up on stage now we're kind of seeing that loosening a bit I should say as as people get more comfortable but it was really important to us to create an environment for for the bands to be able to put on their best show once they manage to get out on stage finally oftentimes I don't know if everybody knows this we get a lot of bands um, that start their tour here because we're not really on the way to any place so we're either the last <laughs> stop or the first stop oftentimes and so we've had a lot of bands even as recently as last week who were walking or you know parking their bus outside of one of our venues and walking in for the first time since before the pandemic and getting ready to play their first show mm -hmm. in front of an audience and so um it's it's just been interesting and and i gotta say is it, 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 it it's it's somewhat challenging but it's just another one of these things we've gotten good at uh navigating uh, yeah. Shane, yeah, unfortunately, we've gotten good at it, you know, and, and maybe <laughs> fortunately for the future as things, you know, as you know, we could have another um, variant or something. Now we do have experience dealing with that. And I think that, um, you know, each each venue, each business, you know, should be kind of monitoring the the transmission rates locally and maybe have a, a reactionary policy or a reflexive policy where if if rates are high you you know you do start um, requiring a mask or just following the local guidance on that but um, like Nate said it really a lot of these shows it is dictated sort of by the artists and what their preference is and um, like Gully Boy said you know you when you're on tour your immune system's down you're traveling you're staying up late you know um, you're getting up early, you're sleeping on a, a bus or in a van or whatever. And um, we want to make sure, you know, as um, promoters of shows that we're keeping artists safe and keeping them comfortable and making sure that, you know, every day is as routine as possible. Cause when you're on the road, everything is just so up in the air. And mm -hmm. especially too, for our staff, we want our staff to be safe. You know, they're not, um, you know, they're the ones that are around hundreds of people every night and those hundreds of people, you know, one of them may be sick. And so having these policies keeps us in business. It keeps us open. Um, and that's sort of the whole point is that it took so long for us to be reopened. Like our whole tagline with Neva was first to close, um, last to open. And um, it, it really is true because we are bringing so many people into one space to breathe the same air um, and get sweaty and be all up in each other's business. And, um, you know, it's, it's it not safe to do that all the time. And so we need to do everything that we can to mitigate those risks. And um, I can't imagine, you know, how many Zoom calls Nate and I probably have been on where someone starts out by saying, well, I'm not a doctor, but, um, you know, and then goes into, you know, why we should do whatever. We all had to become um, sort of, not experts in this stuff, but 
pay attention to science and data and um, just even just the news and policy more than before because everything that's happening um, with this pandemic ha affects our, our bottom line and our ability to have these places of um, you know public accommodation and cultural sort of touchstones for the community and if we you know don't do things right um, well, we will close down and um, these places won't exist for the the arts community here which is so important to Minnesota and and now I think more people are seeing that across the country too that Minneapolis has always been like a cultural hub but um, you know having uh, first Ave kind of be the leader with Neva and um, you know artists like Lizzo being her first show you know back from the pandemic ended up being in Minnesota by default because Bonnaroo got flooded um, but I don't know if you've seen her show uh, <laughs> that just came out but it was actually so cool to see her back kind of in a state where she started and kind of came up through these smaller rooms that you know foster local talent and um, to just kind of have that homecoming show and after two years of not being able to perform um, how happy people were to just be able to go to a show and be together and um, yeah yeah it's line check presented by the current Nate Kranz of First Avenue Shana Melgard of Maniva and Sue McLean Associates thank you so much for being here I'm going to open up the to the audience for some questions and um, also w w Gully Boys had a question too. I, I asked them, I'm like, what would you, I was like, all right, I'm gonna be sitting down with Nate and I'm like, what, what question would you ask them? Um, so we're gonna roll to that and we're also going to roll to the audience and the, I, I forgot to mention their names. It's uh, of the Gully Boys. It's Natalie Clement and Mariah Mercedes, the bassist and guitar player of Gully Boys. I guess we've been disappointed to see so many people dropping the mask and vaccine mandate when it still feels so, um, I don't know, not, not stable and not reliable to be doing this. So I don't know, taking out that little bit of um, support that we had for keeping ourselves safe. Um, that's scary to us and we wish that wasn't happening. So I, I would love to know more about the logic there. <laughs> Why? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I would like to know like what kinds of conversations they're having amongst their people. Who are they talking to? Like out, outside of First Ave, outside of your own echo chamber, like because it seems like all the artists we talk to want the mask mandate and want to want this, and it's venues that are putting pushing it. And I'm sure mm. there are offices and people buying tickets who also don't agree and don't want to wear a mask anymore and I'm sure that puts pressure too but I feel like that is being taken into consideration more than the artists yeah and it puts responsibility on us that we don't want like it's like oh we're we're putting together <laughs> super spreader events potentially like we're we're the catalyst for bringing these crowds together so I, as much as our input is heard that's we want to say is like let's make these events as safe as possible summer is so close and shows are going to be outside and it's going to be a lot safer mm -hmm. um but if you're going inside especially in these little venues that are like 200 cap and they're packed with people oh it hurts me mm -hmm. <laughs> at least wear a mask yeah controversial one which it doesn't seem like it should be controversial but um, it is. And, uh, what is your reaction, uh, both of y'all to that? I mean, like I said, like we, we've just done the same thing we've done this entire time. Um, obviously, like I said, we didn't wait for guidance to, to impose a vaccine mandate on our audience, but we have just literally followed the local state and federal guidance as it comes to masks. And so the moment that you know there was a mandate we wholeheartedly embraced it and enforced it at our venues and once again once that was lifted much like last may when they lifted the restrictions on doing concerts we enthusiastically made plans to reopen um, once the mask mandate was announced that it was coming down 
And CDC guidance said that if your county was low transmission, that uh, there really wasn't a need for the mask mandate. We followed that guidance and and, and changed our policy accordingly. Um, if that changes, we would continue to follow the guidance. If we found ourselves in a spot where the transmission rate was going up or hospitalizations were going up and or if we were seeing outbreaks in businesses like ours, um, I am sure that what we would do is we would continue to follow the science and, and the best guidance out there and put a mask mandate back in place. Other than that, the best I can say is we still do follow if we have an artist that's coming through and they request that they want masks. Um, we had two shows last week that asked us to enforce a mask policy, so we did. We put up the signs, we remind people at the door. If we see people that uh, are not eating or drinking, that aren't wearing a mask, we, you know, we try and be polite about it. We don't want to ruin someone's night, but we remind them that, hey, this is, you, you paid money to see this artist, and this artist, it's important to them that you wear a mask. So ask them to put it on. But that's what we're going to do as a company is continue to just follow best practices. Um, you know, it's, 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 we obviously at First Avenue, we're across the street from Target Center. We see, you know, 15,000 unmasked, unvaccinated possibly people going into events night after night after night. And thankfully, we're still seeing our numbers here locally continue to go down. So I'm optimistic that hopefully we won't get back into that place, but obviously um, still an unknown. Yeah, Shane, anything I think, you Yeah. Yeah, Nate, Nate's right on the money. I mean, most of the, the member venues for Maniva um, are kind of on that same page of, you know, if the artist wants something for their show related to COVID, we're absolutely willing to implement that. And I, I understand that it's maybe a little bit stronger coming from the venue and not the artist having to say, you know, I want this on my show, but I think the true fans of the artists are going to be respectful of the artist and what the artist's wishes are. And, and, you know, hopefully those are the type of fans that are, you know, coming out to shows and they've been, you know, like cooped up for so long and they want to get out and do stuff. And this is what it's going to take to do stuff. So um, we have, you know, all of our shows, we send out a know before you go email that reminds people what the policy is. And um, even on our shows where, you know, there's not a, a mask requirement, it's always recommended right now because of where we're at and we want to be able to uh, continue to to have safe events and have the artists feel comfortable and we want our patrons to feel comfortable too. So until, you know, there's another mandate, it's a little bit hard to enforce, um, you know, but we do have staff that are, like Nate said, you know, we don't want to ruin anyone's night, but we do have to kind of gently remind people that if they're not actively eating or drinking, that you need to, to mask up. Um, I know there's some venues around town that aren't um, able or willing to enforce that because of, you know, different aspects of their business. They've got a restaurant and, you know, restaurants don't have that um, as a mandate anymore. So. You know, I think it kind of just depends and you can always, you know, decide not to play in these places. And I think that sends a message too. you know, the owners need to know what the artists are expecting and um, and requiring really for them to be able to go out and do shows. And um, yeah, yeah, I, I, I would just like to add yeah, that 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 from the venue standpoint, it's also like when we make a rule, it's one thing. But when somebody hears the rule is coming from the artist, and I, I, I could feel that an artist might not want to have that responsibility, but mm -hmm. it's a lot more meaningful, I think. And and mm -hmm. and if they hear that this that that this rule is being enforced on behalf of this artist they like, I think it's an easier pill to swallow than hearing it from one of our security guards um, or whatever. So it's so true. Yeah, as much as like. It, it, as much as it can feel like, oh, I don't want to have to wear a mask, it's it's really not that hard <laughs> to to wear one, and um, and I think a lot of us have gotten used to it, and and we do it out of respect, very much so, and uh, health and safety. Um, all right, I have some questions for from the audience, and keep them coming. Uh, we have a question from Will. He says, "What?"
changes have happened to live music during the pandemic that you think will continue even after the virus isn't a major concern? We have to, uh, just a little bit of time, so um, kind of try, try to keep it as, as brief as we can. Shana, you, you start this lives. one. <laughs> I think, you know, we all kind of had to figure out new technology and, you know, now we're more comfortable taking Zoom meetings instead of meeting in person, even when we can meet in person. I think that kind of goes for live streaming as well. While it's definitely not the same as a live concert experience, you know, for accessibility purposes, it's really nice to have an option to live stream something if you are ill and you can't make it out to a show or something like that. So I think that's something that will stick around a little bit, not on every show or every event, but just as an option for some. Uh, I agree that like live streams aren't going away. I, I think that um, their role is going to be different in a post-COVID or a post-lockdown environment. We've seen certain artists that uh, really exploded in popularity through COVID, managed to managed to, you know, figure out a way to interact with their audiences through live streams. And now that we're back open, they've uh, exploded into real ticket sales. And so I think those bands are going to continue to use live streaming as a complement to their, to their actual tour. Mm -hmm. Any other questions from the audience? While I wait for any others to come through, um, I'd like to say that line check is supported in part by the Minnesota Clean Water, Land, and Legacy Amendment. I'd also like to thank the staff at The Current, especially on production right now, for making this all possible. No more questions. So now we are going to turn <laughs> to... Y'all are thorough. <laughs> thank you once again to <laughs> Nate Kranz and Shana Melgard for your expertise and for being here today and for all you do to make the Minnesota music scene happen. And uh, now we are going to turn back to Nat Harvey for uh, some closing music. Thanks once again, and to the Gully Boys as well. Off the waves like threads Oh, I am the kid with the limp in the movies Forget my name Twenty years old with umbilical cord Wrapped around his neck But he hasn't noticed he's comfortable Going to bed with the lights on and I will be rich when the flood comes I'll look with the lightning done In the south in the glare of my windshield Sweet Holocene And Violet don't know that the world's running out of helium Do when I was your age I learned how to pray from a comic book The houses with their lights off I'll be turning my dogs back into wolves Oh, I only trust the houses with their lights off Set in fire To some ashes I never burn Match. They're telling the same damn time And I know it's just pixels, a number But it still frightens me Under granite and blue sky I needed a knife, but my hands Did find sweetheart sent me a tiny 
fragile vial of my future grave In the morning, I'm with me, I take off my sleep I put on the clothes that keep me standing Ignoring the weight of the eyes on my back And when it's dark out Two young lovers Take a fatal car crash Out on Lakewood Road Line Check is supported in part by the Minnesota Clean Water Land and Legacy Amendment.